Welcome to The Decision from Nashville EO, where you will hear the rest of the story after tough decisions were made by entrepreneurs who faced adversity and lived to tell about it. Welcome to The Decision, the podcast by EO Nashville, for entrepreneurs, by entrepreneurs, it's us telling stories about tough decisions, tough times, how we came out the other side, and with me as always, my partner in crime, Mr. Robert Hartline. Thank you, Eric Jackson. Yes, Good sir. to see you again, sir. Good to see you. Back in the saddle. Back in the saddle. Yes, we are. How's your life been with these oh days? Oh my gosh, my life? Yeah. It's been good. It's been good. It's Friday. Like I, I love doing the podcast on Friday because I feel like I'm actually accomplishing something, settling the week through doing these interviews with you and it gets me excited for the weekend. I feel accomplished. Yeah. That's same. how I feel. Same. Yeah. And with us today, Mr. Tom Turner, longtime EO member. I think 18 years, maybe 19, 18, 19. Yeah. I remember you were in before me and that's, I mean, I've been in for 16 years. It's a long right. haul. We've seen yeah. a lot of things. We have indeed. There were what, mm. probably 40 members when you joined, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. 40 to 50. Yeah. It probably felt a lot different back then. Just a little bit. Just like Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, who was Tom before EO for you? I uh, was an entrepreneur that was trying to figure things out and um, didn't know what I was doing, really. I mean, we were having some success, but I had only gone so far. And uh, fortunately, um, got introduced to EO, thankful to Joe Friedman, who's been in even longer than me. I don't know maybe, tw I don't know how long, 20, 22, 23 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, certainly um, if I think about decisions, I mean, that's one of the ones that, uh, it's the reason I'm still in EO. It was a game changer for me personally, um, getting into EO and wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for Joe. What, what was the business at the time? Uh, well, we came to Nashville in 99. We started as a legal photocopy company, very niche industry, kind of like a Kinko's for law firms. And, um, we, uh, had good timing. We were working on a large case with uh, Dollar General headquartered just up the road and they were being investigated for a securities class action. And we had won this big RFP to work with them. It was massive. And uh, it was a shareholder class action litigation. So the SEC had gotten involved. And I think we had close to 3,000 boxes of documents that had to be photocopied. Uh, and they had to be scanned and put into a database. And that was massive. I mean, that was five or six million pages worth of information. But the SEC came to them and said... Um, in addition to all your paper files, and this was early when businesses were starting to use emails and files, you know, unstructured data. And SEC said, uh, we need all of your electronic data as well. And so they turned to us and said, well, you're hand handling all our paper. Can you help us with the electronic? And we said, yes, we can. <laughs> and we just kind of dug in and figured it out. I um, had developed some friendships in the industry out of the Pacific Northwest, and uh, I called them because they were in the Pacific Northwest and Microsoft and Oracle and Intel. And so they were closer to the technology than we were in Nashville for sure. And I said, hey, we've got this opportunity. Can you help us? And they did. But it was a game changer for us um, and really led to a huge change in our business. We, we, we got out and started talking about... Uh, it didn't exist as a term at the time, but it was called e-discovery or electronic discovery because we worked in discovery for um, the practice of law. And uh, this was just the electronic discovery. And um, so uh, we kept talking to attorneys about it. They didn't want to do it. They didn't understand it. It was cost prohibitive. It was expensive. But then in 2006, the uh, courts got involved and they actually amended the rules of civil procedure and they made electronic discovery a requirement. And they basically said, if you're not doing this, it could be malpractice because you have to fish where the fish are and businesses are moving away. And that was, a, it changed our business overnight. And we had been doing it already for four or five years. We were early, early adopter. 
And uh, so it helped us really scale our business from there. We went from being brick and mortar. We had offices in Nashville, I think Chicago, Atlanta. And then we changed our whole business model. We, we sold off our Chicago and Atlanta office. And um, we uh, started getting into opening offices around the country by just putting salespeople in those cities because we, where we couldn't ship boxes back to Nashville, we could ship electronic data. And by comparison, I think that Dollar General case that we worked on, we, we had, you know, four or five million pages worth of information. Um, but the, but the, the e-discovery portion represented 10 to 12 million. And as we started getting into e-discovery, one terabyte of data was the equivalent of about 75 million pages worth of information. And by the time when we ultimately sold the business the first time in 2017, you know, we were taking cases that might have four or five terabytes of data. So you think about that, you're talking about, you know, 200 and 220 million pages. I mean, the volumes of data were just massive. So anyway, it, it changed our business significantly. We went from being a paper-based business in 1999 to by the time we sold, again, the first time in 2017, we were, you know, 90% a digital electronic. We were doing computer forensics and software as a service, and we had a software development team, our own platforms, and a lot changed. At the time when you joined EO, what were you hoping to achieve out of joining the, the community? Um, I, I really didn't know. I mean, I just, um, in fact, you know, um, based on our conversations, we thinking about decisions for me that were so impactful, uh, joining EO was one that, um, I was, we were initially introduced to EO by Joe I'd mentioned, and we didn't qualify cause we weren't big enough. And then as I began to grow, we passed a million dollars in revenue. We qualified and then I got so busy and I even got a little bit maybe um, prideful, you know, and I was like, well, we're two trailing towards three million in revenue. Like, I don't need EO. I don't understand about these forums and experiences shares. I'm like, these guys are, you know, I don't need them. Mm. And uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so um, we. Uh, Fortunately, made the decision to join EO. I got into a great forum. And, you know, for me, it became a like a miniature private board of directors, right? It just, it became a um, platform where I was comfortable sharing and learning from experiences from others about things in business that I just didn't get a chance to talk to with other people. Like most of my friends in my community weren't business owners. They worked for other companies and the kinds of things that we dealt with as entrepreneurs, they weren't conversations that I was having with anybody else. And I felt like in some ways I was on an island. And uh, then all of a sudden, again, I was drinking from the fire hydrant, you know, every single meeting, every forum meeting that I came away with. But even with NEO, I then struggled for a few years because I only did my forum and I did a few events in Nashville. And thankfully, I stayed in EO and um, I was encouraged to start taking advantage of some of the other events. And I remember going to my first Nerve event in D.C. and it was a game changer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, again, blew my mind. So many great authors and speakers and books to start reading and consuming and, uh, and then, and then later, um, uh, Entrepreneur's Master's Program, which, you know, for anybody that is NEO, I would highly recommend. In fact, I would say I might, might trade my 18 years of EO for the three years that I had at EMP. It may, I mean, it was just perfect timing for us in terms of where I was in my business. But it, it had a significant multiplier effect in mm. terms of what I learned um, particularly in the first year and the second year, third year was good, but those first and second years, I mean, I have a, a book that they gave us for taking notes and, and I still, it's my business Bible. I mean, I still use that today a lot to look back over the notes that I took in those, um, classes while I was there 
that were just tremendous in terms of growth of our business, uh, culture in our business, leadership in our business, ideas for um, so many different things that helped us. What, what specifically did you get out of it right away? I think, well, uh, you know, we, we were struggling at the time. Um, one thing I remember in particular, we leading up to that is, uh, I remember being at a nerve event and I'd heard Jack Daly talking about culture and culture, at least for me back then, wasn't a, a word that you heard a lot in business. It was somewhat new in terms of being introduced to business. At least it was for me. And what he said was, everybody has a culture. You either have a culture by design or you have a culture by default. And we had an ugly culture leading up to my first kind of year in, in EMP, or maybe, maybe 18 months prior to that. And by the way, um, I, I think another very important decision that, that we made, which I would not have been introduced to if it had not been for EO, was we ultimately made the decision to hire a business coach. And, you know, it was, it was one, joining the right organization for us, which was EO, because there were other organizations mm -hmm. that we were, people were reaching out to us. And I just very thankful that we made the decision to join EO or to join an organization because we could have not done anything, right? Um, Two was uh, through EO, we got introduced to um, Vern Harnish and the concept of Rockefeller Habits or scaling up. And um, we, we tried doing that uh, miserably for a year or two on our own. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's a, another part maybe of my story. But uh, we, we later thankfully made the decision to hire Petra Coach to help us scale our business. And I thought that would be a six month, maybe 12 month relationship. And it ended up being almost an eight year partnership that helped us to grow and scale and successfully exit our business. Mm. Going back to EMP. So we had been, we had hired Petra coach. Um, Andy was a big part. In fact, I had applied to entrepreneurs master's program didn't take it very seriously. I'm like, we've got a good business. We're doing great. I filled out the application and I didn't get in. I was like, didn't me? Like, what else do they need? So came back and talked to some of the guys that were mentors to me, um, Andy Bailey and Arnie Malum and guys that Joe had been through EMP also. And they were like, we can help. You need to fill this out. You need to take it seriously. And so a few years later, I actually applied and that's when I got in. So it was leading up to that. We were working on our culture. We were working on having a culture by design. But um, I remember sitting in a class and uh, they were talking about culture at, at EMP in our first year. And I had somewhat tuned out because um, we had spent so much time. I felt we were kind of leading the charge on culture. And I was like, anything they're going to tell us, I've already heard. And then they put up a picture of this guy that was uh, waving out of his airplane. And they said, take this guy as example. And by building an amazing culture in his business, he was able to sell his company in an industry, in the call center industry, which on average sells for three to four times. He was able to sell his business for 21 times earnings. And that got my attention. We had been working on culture, not for purposes of selling our business, but we were working it because uh, I was losing a lot of our best employees from our big national competitors. Deloitte & Touche is based here in Nashville. They have a huge data processing facility out at Hermitage. And so we had a history of hiring people in as a photocopy operator or a scan operator, <clears throat> excuse me and training them up into the positions that they were in. We invested a lot of time and energy and money. And oftentimes they would end up in a position where they were well compensated, but maybe not at top of market. And the reason they weren't is because we had invested so much of our money into sending them to get trained and to get, and then Deloitte and Touche would come in or Kroll on track would come in and they'd offer them $7,000 or $10,000 a year more and take them away. 
And so I finally was drawing the line in the sand and I said, look, I can't compete with these guys financially, but I can compete with them by making our, our company not only the best in our industry, but the best in the country as a place to work. And that became a mission of ours to build an incredible culture where people, we wanted them, we wanted a culture of accountability. We wanted all of our employees to think like business owners, like we did. And, and we built performance-based compensation around that such that when we were successful, um, we won. When they were successful, they won, right? So we, we aligned our interests as employees and owners. And that was what we were working towards doing. But then what we began to realize uh, over a period of time, and this was, again, even after EMP, but by building an amazing culture, um, we not only reduced our turnover, but then we began to see that we were able to attract talent that we had not historically been able to attract. And even in some situations, we were attracting people that were taking not a ton, maybe once, maybe twice in a one to three year period. But we were in competitive situations where we were recruiting and trying to hire someone and they accepted a position working with us for ten, twelve thousand $12,000 a year less than what they were able to take with the competitor because they wanted to be a part of this culture that we were building. Um, so um, I, that was one. Right. The other was, um, again, uh, I vividly remember Vern Harnish saying in one of the meetings, I had been the, I was the founder of the company. Um, I brought in a business partner who was incredible. We owned the business 50-50, Kevin Tyner, and uh, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for him. He and I were just yin and yang. We were perfect in our partnership. We had our challenges, but it was, it was, it was, we were very fortunate to have each other, I think. And um, I didn't enjoy being the president of the company, honestly. It was just what I had done because that was, I was the founder and I thought that's what I had to do. And um, I remember being in an EMP class and Vern Harnish was one of our speakers. And he said, um, often with entrepreneurial led businesses, the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. And I remember writing that down and I stopped. And I had to digest it, you know, and like kind of process it for a minute. And I was like, holy crap, like, that's me. Like, I got to get out of my own way. And I came back from that class. I remember meeting. We were on a retreat, a quarterly planning session with myself and our leadership team. And I began working with our business coach, Andy Bailey. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to be the president of the company anymore. I don't do a great job of it. I don't like doing it. And if it hadn't been for EMP and that statement from Vern and the ability to put that in through having a business coach. And again, I think the second point is um, whether or not you hire a business coach in EOS or Rhythm or scaling up rock habits, the idea not to be so prideful or arrogant to think that you can't learn from somebody. And I can't remember, it may have been at EMP as well. They talked about being inside of the glass or outside of the glass. And I think oftentimes as entrepreneurs, we get stuck inside of the glass and we need to get somebody from outside of the glass to give us a perspective, um, to hold us accountable, to challenge us. And that's what, that's what rock habits became for us. In fact, um, you know, we, we were having great luck in our business. We were growing very quickly. And uh, we had been on Inc. 500, 5,000 for a few years. And um, Andy Bailey had owned a business before, had sold his business. He had done a lot of things in his business that he had learned through EO, Rock Habits and Scaling Up. And I'm sorry, Rock Habits and Top Grading and other mm -hmm. things. Um, and uh, Top Grading was another thing I learned a lot more about at EMP that was um, really tremendous for us in hiring because we did a lot of hiring and we were awful at it. And, and EMP helped us because we got introduced to the who, Jeff Smart, Randy Street, I think, if I remember the authors. And, um, but, uh, you know, we were debt free as a company. I was making more money than I ever thought I would make. And I hated my job. I was miserable. Um, we had grown, I want to say we were approaching maybe 10 million in revenue at the time. 
And I, I was hearing from different people in, o, in EO, like 10 million is kind of a glass ceiling. It's a tough, tough one to break through. And we were there and we were struggling and I hated getting up and going to work. My business partner was the same way. And uh, Andy had been calling on us as Petra coach. And I was like, Andy, man, no offense, but like, I know, I know what you're doing, scaling up our rock habits and I appreciate it, but like, I don't need you. You know, we're doing this stuff. And uh, he would still gently stay in touch and follow up and come talk to me. And he caught me on a bad day. <laughs> you know how to do his job. <laughs> yeah. And he's persistent. If anything. <laughs> Indeed. And um, he's like, what's going on? And I told him and uh, I was like, I'm miserable, man. And I can't quit. What am I going to go do? I'm unemployable. You know, mm-hmm. I've been doing this for. And uh, he said, well, can I tell you what your problem is? And I was like, <laughs> You know, okay, who are you? Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> I was like, man, you don't even understand what I do, right? Like you're going to tell me and, and somewhat arrogantly, I was like, yeah, please tell me what my problem is. And he said, your problem is your revenues are growing, you know, 30 to 40 to 50% some years, uh, year over year, but your people and your processes aren't. And it was another one of those kind of pinned down like, <gasps> like what? He's like, yeah. He's like, what got you here is not going to get you there. Another great book. Yep. And, um, and I was like, and, and you can help us with that? And he's like, that's what we do. And I got up and I walked into my business partner, who was our CFO. And I said, Kevin, you know what the definition of insanity is. And, and that's what we're living, right? Like this isn't going to change. We got to do something. And I'm like, I don't care what it costs us. We're going to try this. We're going to spend the money. We're going to make the investment. And it was freaking hard. I mean, you're, you do EOS, right? Yeah. I mean. Ab- what I think is funny about this conversation is how many people think that their business is so special. Yeah. And that they're so unique and different. And at the end of the day, it's people. 100%. The hard stuff is always the things that surround exactly what you do. And that's people and process and finance and mm. Those are the things that we struggle with. We can do the work. Yeah, and we are the we are the the core problem. So, did you identify? Uh, well, you didn't want to be president, but what did you want to do? Yeah, so I changed my title. I became um, chairman executive slash steward of purpose, and actually, R and D. I didn't know what R and D was, by the way. That was another EMP thing. <laughs> Excuse me. I remember sitting in an EMP class and somebody said R and D. I'm like, man, we're not that big. Like research development team. I don't, you know. And he was like, no, 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 rip off and duplicate. And we did a lot of that, um, and a lot from Arnie Malum. I mean, Arnie, kudos to that. And he, you know, wrote a great book about it and uh, built an incredible culture that we are indeed a lot of ideas. Book club was one that that we implemented in our business and others. Um. But uh, our, our purpose as an organization was e-discovery about people, and our people were a three-legged stool. It was first and foremost our employees, and it was a waterfall down from there. We felt like if we really took care of our employees and listened to our employees, um, tried to help our employees, we had this uh, entire program called Discover You, which is a whole process about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. and. Um, helping people to get better, to achieve goals. And we had people do amazing things, people that quit smoking, that had been smoking for 18 years, people that built, took a home, uh, took a school bus and converted it into a, an RV that they used in travel. That, was, that wasn't a goal, but they had to go through a committee and it had to be approved and they had the steps outlined. People lose tons of weight. I mean, just all kinds, runs marathons. We had all kinds of great things, but it was about trying to help our people get better. And, and that was both personally just and people. professionally. It was just people. Yeah, that just was, helping the people. And um, so it was first our employees. And if we took care of our employees, then second was our um, customers. And if we took care of our customers, our community. And we felt like we had a responsibility specifically for Nashville, but we tried to do in others. And we had created a program called Discover Your Community where we allowed our employees to volunteer, to give back, because what we had been doing previously, we had large clients that would say, hey, support us. And they were big clients. So we wrote checks. 
our employees didn't even know what we were supporting. They didn't know anything about it. And at some point, because we kept having employees come and say, will you give us money? Can I get time? So we, it was hard. It was a big decision. We went to those clients and said, I know we've supported you in this for so many years, but from here on, we have a process. Here's what the process is. It's a committee. It has to go through our company. Our company, our employees will help choose what those things are. We would still, we would still give money. But a lot of times it became not just giving money, it became matching money, or it became um, giving time of our employees to go. And that was, a, I mean, it exploded. Uh, it was a big part of uh, the giving back. And a lot of the employees that we had were really involved and felt like that made a big impact in them and their ability to support things outside of the company that were important to them. So that was it. E-discovery about people. And um, we used a software I became fanatical about, another EO-based business. It was called Tiny Pulse. It's like an internal NPS, Net Promoter Score. Uh, We used something else for external NPS. But I became fanatical about getting feedback from our employees and responding to all of the feedback and trying to problem solve. But it it was also, um, you know, you guys are familiar with DISC. I'm I'm an S and an I. And uh, I like trying to help people and solve problems. And as we continued to grow, you know, I think by the time we sold her around 85 or 90 employees, and um, it was killing me, really, trying, you know, because I would fix a problem for, for two people, but it created a problem for 15 yeah, more. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's what I became uh, chairman, executive, steward of purpose. Mm. So... Back to your EO experience, was there a time that you had a big decision you know you needed to make, but you were struggling and you brought it to your form for assistance to help you navigate that? Um, selling our business. That wow. was that was one. And um, D- the decision to sell or what to sell for or what the conditions were, What explain that decision. Yeah. Uh, all, I had a, I had a, for confidentiality purposes, I had a a forum member that um, was selling his business. And uh, he told me about some of the things that he had done. Um, They were his, he had a large business. They were $115, $120 million company. And uh, he was telling me about some of the things that he had done in his business. And um, I was like, there's, that's not possible, right? There's, there's no way that you can do that. And Suffice it to say, a lot of it had to do with estate planning. And uh, I, I was like, he, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's like, well, let me introduce you to the attorney that I worked with from an estate planning standpoint. And, um, and he did. And we went and met with him. And um, as we continued down the road and made the decision that we definitely wanted to sell the business, it was... Um, it, it had a significant impact in our ability to do some of the estate planning things that we did. In fact, today, that's what I do. I worked with um, a mergers and, mergers and acquisition company called STS Capital, which was another uh, um, pivotal decision for us. We, we had interviewed seven different bankers. Uh, and, and we interviewed, you know, the big guys like Houlihan, Loki down to the small industry focused, very specialized guys. Um, and through Petra and through EO, remember the guy that I said was waving out of the airplane? Well, he had sold his business with STS Capital and then later joined STS Capital, which is kind of a model for STS Capital. And, um, and so, uh, we ended up making the decision to hire STS Capital. And one of the things that I see today uh, working with entrepreneurs exiting their companies are that they often, they wait so long until it's time to sell their business and then they're 100% focused on the sale of their business and they've not focused on the pre-planning, things like uh, tax planning, estate planning, um, things that they can do, um, uh, donor advice funds, right. That are really, really can play a big part. If you're going to give any of the sale of your business, depending on what you're doing pre or post sale to, um, to, for philanthropic purposes, it can make a big impact. And, um, so 
it, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, but, um, it was talking through the forum, talking through those in my forum, and in particular, this one guy who had just gone through all of this a year prior to my going through it. The other were just all the things that we came up with that we dealt with in the business leading up to the emotion around selling. I mean, I'd had the company when we sold again the first time for 17 years. I mean, these some of these people had been with me since they graduated from college working with us. They were like family, you know, it was, and it was tough. Like, is this really what we want to do? Is it the right thing to do? And um, they were just, uh, I mean, you guys know, right? You're in forums. I mean, they just, they helped me through some very, very difficult times of things that we were dealing with. And they were... I can't necessarily give specific examples, um, but they gave me great advice and food for thought about things to go back and remember um, who we were, why we were doing what we were doing, and and just help me through the entire process. What was your desire to sell? Why? Yeah. Um, it was it was a number of different factors, but uh, one was because uh, this was back in. To leading up to 2017. And at the time, it seemed like wherever I went, whether it was a GroCo conference in Nashville or a scaling up conference or a, or an industry technology conference, I, there always seemed to be someone that was talking about now is the best time ever in the last 80 years, maybe ever to think about selling your business because the markets are flush with cash and valuations are at all time high. And continu- they just continued actually from there going up, up, up until they kind of busted a little bit and reset in 20, into 2022, 23. And um, so that was one. And we were, we had grown to about 27 million in revenue and there had been a lot of consolidation in our industry. And we were, um, the vast majority of our industry, uh, they sold price and we did not sell price. In fact, we had a reputation of being one of the more expensive, if not the most expensive. We sold value. And we wanted to work with clients that appreciated the value and what we did. And our pitch was, and it wasn't a pitch, it was legitimate. We were leveraging Today, you would call it artificial intelligence, but we were leveraging statistics and other kind of cutting edge algorithms through our software to take large volumes of mostly non-relevant information in the database and call it down in a defensible, repeatable way to relevant volumes of information that the attorneys had to look at. Because if we could eliminate a hundred thousand documents or a million documents, that was a hundred thousand or a million documents that that outside, I'm sorry, the corporations didn't have to pay outside counsel to look at. So where they may spend a million dollars with us, it saved them four million dollars in legal fees, right? And um, as we were seeing all this consolidation take place, we didn't know where we were gonna fit. And it was, it was, we either had one of two or three options. And that was buy some other companies. And we were scared about doing that because there weren't a lot of companies that we felt felt fit what our model was and what we did. Two was, um, and plus we didn't know what we were doing. We had never done that, right? Two was um, just put the pedal down and keep doing what we were doing. But, you know, for those you know, like you guys have owned and operated businesses, it's one thing to grow your business from 1 million to 2 million, it's 100% growth. And 2 million to 4 million is 100% growth. But when you start getting into 15 to 30 million and 30 to 60 million, um, it's not I, the same thing. It's not the same not thing. Faint of heart. Yeah. And, and, and we just didn't know if we had it in us. Yeah. And Microsoft had just introduced 365 and they were building out e discovery capabilities into Microsoft 365. And we were like, there's a potential that this will literally kill our, I mean, it'd become a multi-billion dollar industry. And we were seeing some of that. We were also seeing the effects of Moore's law 
And, and so our margins and the cost, I mean, when we first started doing electronic discovery or e-discovery, they paid us, Dollar General paid us somewhere in the neighborhood of $18,000 per gigabyte of data that we were ingesting and putting into the database. Today, I don't know what it would cost, but by the time we sold in 2017, that same gigabyte of data had fallen from seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars to maybe two hundred and fifty dollars. Wow. Now on the other side of that was a big case for us when we first started was five gigs. And by the time we sold in 2017, we were getting cases that had four to five thousand gigs, right? So the volumes just exploded. Um and I think also my business partner and I, you know, the third option, we were like, well, if we can find the right partner, if we can find somebody, we've got all these employees that have been with us and we just don't know how much longer we can do it. We want a place for them that we can help them to continue have growth and opportunity. Um, and that's what ultimately STS helped us to find. And we found a great partner and, um, it, you know, the company's grown. So we, we sold uh, to a quasi-strategic. It was a private equity-backed corporation based here in Nashville, founded by um, local entrepreneur Jane Allen, who was, you know, president of the uh, uh, Nashville Entrepreneur Center for a number of years, just rolled off. And she started that company. And then her husband, Greg, came in. They built a great business. And um, we had worked with them for about a decade. That's that that story and process is a whole separate story, but um, uh, private equity bought us and um, I exited after I sold the company um, from day to day, but stayed on the board for another, oh, four years. And we did uh, two more acquisitions. So we were about, I think, 27 million and uh, they were about 45 million. So we were around 70 million in revenue through the merger acquisition. And then we did two more acquisitions that got us up to about 140 million. And we organically grew it from 140 to about 180 uh, when we sold in December of 21 again. And now they're, you know, they're the largest e discovery. They're wow. two plus billion in revenue, right? I mean, it's they're massive. Five thousand full time employees. They're so you huge. have mastered being an EO. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think ultimately, I mean, yeah, the business exponentially grew, and I, I would assume your personally, your personal life uh, went along for the ride. Hundred percent. And yeah. and again, I go back to. Um, EO giving me that mindset. And frankly, again, um, Patrick Coach helping in, in that tremendously as well. So if you're a new person in EO, what uh, tips would you give them to, to maximize the opportunity of, of the experience? Of EO? Don't limit yourself to just the forum experience for sure. Um, um, and, and, you know, one of the things, regrettably, I've not done more of, and I wish that I had, and I did it, I think, for a year or two, was participating in the board. Um, you know, I can make all the excuses in the world, but I just felt like I was too busy. But I do regret because I think it gives you a different perspective of of who EO is, and it opens a lot of other doors for you. I know you've done a lot of that as well, Eric. Um, and um, so I would take advantage of, I mean, just in Nashville the opportunities that are here through EO, but expanding that to go into a global, absolutely go into Entrepreneur's Master's Program. I mean, it is, again, my... You've done it too, right? I Eric? just finished year three. I'm in uh, withdrawal right now yeah. from it. We finished on Saturday. Wow. Game changer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It, You're inspiring it, me over here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> I, I got to fill out a form. <laughs> it, it, it's great. It's and... and you know, the thing that's really neat about it, I never will forget for me was, um, so I don't know about your class. We had, we had 67 yep. class members. And I think out of our 67, 22 were from the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. So two thirds of our class, I mean, they were from all over the world, from Costa Rica, uh, Central America, South America, all over Africa, Russia, um, Eastern Europe. I mean, they were from all over the world. Yeah. 
And the really, really comforting, cool thing about it was, A, as different as we were, how much we were all exactly the same. And the other was, I, I want to say, just as it has been um, kind of politically and maybe even economically in the U U.S. over the last 10 years, it just seemed like it's, um, we're very divided, right? And and then when you look at other parts of the world, you think, well, they're in worse shape than we are, right? That's what you see and hear on the news. And then when you get into the, with all these other people, they're like, man, things are great. Come visit. <laughs> like, economy's great. People are great. Like, we're afraid to come here to the U.S., right? And it's because we, we listen to all this crap. I mean, another huge mentor to me from EO that was another big part that changed my life was this. Warren Rustand, I heard speak in multiple, multiple times, and he became a mentor to me. And I started something that he called his 10, 10, 10 routine, which was waking up every single morning, um, taking 10 minutes to just be thankful, just to be appreciative to the, the, that you have your health and you have your business and you have all the things that you have that you can be thankful for. And then taking uh, 10 minutes to read for something that's uplifting and motivational and then taking 10 minutes to write about it. And it was a game changer in me starting my day and what my day, and I did, I'm, I had, I did that for years until I had soldier surgery and I quit, I quit my journaling. I still do the other two tens, but I, I need to get back to the journaling because I didn't like it. But, you know, he was like all day long, you got so much negativity coming at you, whether it's on your phone or on the radio or on the TV. He's like, turn that mess off, start your day in a positive mindset. And, um, and he was right. And it, he changed my life. Yeah. Warren's I mean, unbelievable. You, you can't sit in that room for two and a half hours in at Endicott house and listen to him and not go away a different person. Yeah. Mm. And again, I, I wouldn't have ever been introduced to Warren if it hadn't been for EO. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, I, you said it, I mean, he, EO changed my life personally and professionally. And so did Petra. And frankly, so did STS. I mean, I will say part of the reason that we ended up going with STS was managing directors, all of their managing directors, which are people who do what I do, um, are former owner operators. And when we were interviewing different bankers, um, one of the things we highlighted as a difference, what STS calls Rembrandt's in the attic, right? Like, what is it that makes you special and different? And we talked about our culture. and. I remember vividly walking through and no offense to these guys because they were very smart and they, they, you know, they had all their MBAs, but they never owned a business. They never operated a business. And I was showing one of them through and um, I talked about our culture. And he said, uh, literally, culture smolcher. Everybody's selling culture these days. Nobody's buying it. And, oh, wow. and I didn't say it, but I thought to myself, like, you're an idiot. You've yeah. clearly, yeah. You, know, you have no appreciation for how hard yeah. this is. We don't care about people. Didn't care about that. people. Yeah. And, and versus when we brought in STS, who had owned a business, grown a business, scaled a business, exited a business, and we showed him our culture. And he was like, this is a game changer. He got it. He knew rock habits. He knew the challenges around, you know, working with coaches yeah. and changing. I mean, they just got it. And by the way, um, STS is also industry agnostic and the other guys were telling us that we were going to portray it in the 10 to 12 times, um, EBITDA range. And, and that's because we're all the other businesses they dealt with. And STS was telling us, no, 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 no. We think you're worth more. And we actually almost didn't go with them. And, and we were like, well, you guys could be telling us, they were telling us they thought we'd sell for 16 to 20 times. And I was like, well, they could tell us 50 times. They just want our business. And they were like, no, no, no. We legitimately, well, they ran us through the process, a very, very long, painful process, not because of them. It, it's a whole separate story. Uh, but ultimately, we sold for just under 21 times EBITDA, wow. which wouldn't have happened without them or Petra or EO. And you were first introduced with a picture of a guy looking out of a window. That's right. And th that, that set the stage that you knew it was possible. Yes. Isn't it funny that those those MBAs they they can read a P and L, and the whole culture smulcher thing, it's not there's no line item for it, but it's, it's it is the P and L. That's exactly that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. This is, this is awesome. Thank you for your commitment to EO and, um, uh, thank you for uh, all these awesome things you said to inspire other people to live this EO life. Listen, if you are an entrepreneur here in Nashville, Tennessee, and you want to learn about EO, you can visit eonashville.com and see how over 380 members are here. The largest chapter in the United States are here to support your entrepreneurial journey. Hope you have a fantastic week and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Decision Podcast by Nashville EO. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.